Well, good morning and welcome to John Fields Baptist Church. My name is Andy Gore. I am the pastor of this church and welcome to another recorded Sunday morning service. Today is a bright and sunny day and today we're actually not in this building but we are having an outdoor service and so if you're not able to be there, welcome. I'd like you to press pause because today is a communion service so you will need some bread and you will need some wine and also you will need a piece of paper like this, a blank sheet of A4 if possible uh, or other side of a bill and a pen. But just a couple of notices for those of you who live in Dronfield. Monday is, on, e on the evening is our prayer meeting and you're welcome to come and join either via Zoom or in person. But also on Thursday we are having a weekly communion service at 11 o'clock at Coffee Pot. Coffee Pot Communion. Ray led last week and I'm leading this week. It's an opportunity if you're not able to be here on a Sunday for communion to come and share, or even if you come, you can come on Sundays, to come and share together as we break bread, drink wine, just to encourage and to bless each other. Our final notice is from Andy. Cheers, mate. Hi, good morning. Uh, just wanted to do a quick video message to you all to say thank you to everyone for praying for us. Uh, this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we had Youth Fest. Uh, we had a load of young people here, all slept over. We had just a blinding couple of days, uh, three days in all. From Monday morning they came, they went Wednesday. Lunchtime, we went out, we did a lot. So it was really good fun, really good time spent with some leadership from the Oaks. Uh, their youth leaders came and helped and that was really good, forged some really good relationships with them. But it was just great to see the young people again and again rebuild and reconnect with them. So thank you all so much for your prayers, especially big thank you to, to those who came and, and helped and came with us. Chris Turk came to Cosmo with us. But huge thanks to those who opened up their houses and allowed us to come and visit their houses and take part in treasure hunts. Uh, couldn't have done it without you and the kids loved it. So thank you. Um, Holiday Club is not this coming week, but the following week, so I think it's the 23rd, um, Holiday Club is on. Please do come along and help in the morning. Uh, ideally, we're going well, to meet to pray at about half nine every morning, so if you can be here for then, that would be great. It's kicking off at 10. Uh, it's going to be very similar to previous years when we've done it live, uh, with the children coming in with some crafts, some singing, some stories, splitting into two. Uh, really need team to help with the crafts with the children. Uh, Becca Keen's going to be doing the games, so I'm really grateful to her for coming to do that. So it's taken a big pressure off. I just need to get all the talk sorted. So please do come along, get involved. Thank you to those who've said they're going to be in the kitchen. I know Moira and uh, Mrs. Athey have said they can do the kitchen and do all that for us. And so please do come along, come and get involved. It's going to be great. Um, but then also a plea for September. Uh, Schools go back uh, and we start back from the 6th of September with all our groups. J3 is still a bit dicey. I'm, I'm desperate for a female leader, someone to be there. It's our year 10, 11, 12 group. Uh, it's a youth club. It will be year 10s. They're a lovely bunch. They're a really good bunch of kids. And they're kids that we've had from year five all the way through now to year 10. A load of them came to Youth Fest this week and we're just buzzing to find out that it's back on. But I really could do with some more team for that group. So if, you, if you're free, it's a Wednesday, it's 3.30 till five, I'm, I'm just desperate. If that's something you could please do, please get in touch soon. And if we get enough people, we can set a road truck so you don't need to do it all the time and it runs during term time. Uh, and then also Aftershock, still after some more team for Aftershock. Uh, ideally, again, females, leaders for that. By leaders, you're there. Uh, you can engage with the young people, but that, that's, you're not going to be expected to actually do anything as such. Just be there with us. And that's going to be Mondays, ever, only every other Monday. So fortnightly, um, start on Mondays from 7.30 to 9. I know it's a late one. Uh, but again, those, that's a group where we are sharing the gospel with those children and they are uh, receptive to it and listening to what we're saying. And, and they're choosing to come to that group uh, where, where we tell them about Jesus. Uh, it's very much like 
the the uh, the other group the, uh, that I've just spoken about on a Wednesday, but they get some Christian input there. So if you could do either of either of those things, uh, Monday, uh, seven thirty to nine, or Wednesday J three, which is three thirty to five, I'd be really really grateful. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for your prayers for Youth Fest. It's gone great. Really looking forward to Holiday Club, and I can't wait for September to get back seeing our young people. So thanks everyone for all you've done. All you're doing with the prayer and the support you'll be giving to me and the rest of the team. I really do appreciate it. See you soon. Have a good Sunday. Bye. I'd like you to take your piece of paper because what I want you to do is to tear across. Now, I've been practicing this and the easiest way I found of doing it is to, first of all, fold your paper in half lengthways to get half this length and then what I would like you to do is to fold from the top essentially to about halfway so you get a small flap here and a lot the longer flap there and what we're going to do is we're going to tear what's called a plain Latin cross please do not use scissors the whole point of this is that we have a ragged and a rugged cross. So let's go, we do it a bit here like this. And so you make sure to try and get a nice wide tear there. Till you're near your fold, then you fold and you tear across ways like this. And then you start again underneath your fold here and you tear it again till you're about the same width as last time and then you fold all the way down i was going to say carefully but let's but because we're tearing it so you tear it thoughtfully and you should end up with a cross just like that that's all rugged because today we're thinking about the cross as we begin looking at a two series on lament lament is connecting with our emotions and we're thinking about all our emotions to do with the 17 months we've had of lockdown. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to write on the top arm of your cross something that describes all of what lockdown has meant to you. To try and obviously don't write in every, all the paper, just, just the top bit there and just and then press pause and then when you've done that after press then you also can write in the middle what the cross means to you so the top part write about your experience your feeling about the lockdown the all those emotions of the last 17 months and then in the middle where your folds cross write what the cross means to you We come to worship, worship the God who poured himself out on us. And we know this, we know how much God loves us because his son died for us, which is why we have this torn out cross. I want you to hold on to your cross throughout the service. And we're going to sing some songs, we're going to sing, We Bow Down, Here is Love as Vast as the Ocean, and O oh, Love that will not let me go. As we sing, think about all of which you wrote about the cross, what the cross means to you. So let's sing and worship together.
you to come to have time of, of prayer yourself. Prayer, giving thanks for all that the cross means to you, how it's helped you in these last 17 months or so. So let's pray together. When I began thinking about the service, I asked people in church whether they'd like to come and share a testimony. And Sandra Herman is going to share a testimony and she's going to about, about five minutes. And as you listen to it, I'd like you to write on one of the arms, what you picked up about what Sandra's experience has been, something that's blessed or spoken into your life about her testimony, because the whole heart of this is that we listen to and we share testimony with each other. Because for these two here, which would be blank if you're watching, you can either ring a friend, ask somebody who you know what it's been like 
in these last 70 months and include their names, their details here, their stories here, and then you can pray for them later on after the service. So let's listen to Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, church. I wanted to share with you today a little of what has been happening in my life over the last 18 months. I know for many of you, lockdown has been a really difficult time and perhaps still is. My lockdown has been a time of rekindling my friendship with God. I hope that I can encourage you to share your joys and sadnesses with each other. I believe it was Paul who tells us to bear each other's burdens. It can really encourage us if we know what's going on in other people's lives and we can also support them. Most of you know I've been a Christian for a very long time, but probably don't know for, for a long time, I was at a really low point spiritually for a number of years actually. If you'd asked me, like most of us do, I would have said, I'm fine, everything's okay. But it wasn't. Like most Christians, my faith journey has been up and down over the years, but latterly I've been going through a very dark tunnel. In the past, I had a really busy time at church. I slotted into various roles, teaching, youth work, leadership, catering and cleaning. I retired from a very demanding and fulfilling nursing career some years ago now, and I expected my free time to be as satisfying as my work life. I also stepped down for some of the church activities for various reasons, but I did stay very busy with other things, but I didn't find fulfillment, not the fulfillment I needed and I wanted. I didn't know where I belonged or fitted in in church. I didn't know what purpose I had. I carried on going through all the motions of going to church, attending groups, doing some of the jobs, but my heart wasn't in it. I became very critical. The preaching wasn't right. Worship didn't do anything for me. I felt so lonely that when I went through through the back for coffee, I expect some of you feel like that sometimes. Being lonely in a crowd is really difficult. And I was getting nothing from church. I didn't like the way that I felt. I was quite unhappy inside. So I chatted to some friends and I forced myself to enrol on a course in Sheffield last year. Like I started last September. It was called Going Deeper with Jesus. I was looking for inspiration and hoping that I would come out with a plan for my future. I believed I did have a future, a future with God that is. It was a difficult year, a big time commitment on my part. It involved hours of reading, studying the Bible and lots of other books. It took a lot of discipline there was prayer and worship two days a week in Sheffield, so I had to get up early and go into Sheffield. The teaching was really good. I learned an awful lot. Not everything was easy for me, or was to my taste. I had to do a lot of soul searching in that time and repenting. The most important thing I felt was that the father was telling me that he really loved me. I didn't need to look for another job or a role to fit in. He just wanted me to sit at Jesus's feet and soak up that abundant love. Church wasn't about what I got out of it. It wasn't about me. I was there to worship God, my saviour, my king, my friend and Lord. I was there to thank him for what he'd done for me. I was there to share his love freely with others as he loves me. So I'm here now, a year later, 
totally content, happy and at peace with myself, knowing, knowing that my future is in God's hands. I don't have to worry about it. I just have to stay close to him. That does need a bit of discipline, quiet times on a regular basis, prayer and worship. And sometimes I might not feel like it, but it pays off. So I just wanted to share that with you and hope that you can share your stories and continue to stay close to our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, ever so much for that. We're going to come to a time of communion, which is a, it's a different place within our service. But it's as we come to the table, we remind ourselves that here, as Jesus broke bread, drank wine with his friends before the cross, it was when he felt closest to them, when he was encouraged and strengthened by their friendship and by their fellowship as they listened together to the story of Passover because Jesus came as the Lamb of God. He came to bring a new Passover, which is what the supper is about, the bread and the wine. And we remind ourselves he is the Lamb whose blood was poured for us that we may be free. So press pause if you need to get your bread and get or get your wine. We come together to remind ourselves that the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and wine. In the midst of the meal, having prayed, having listened to the story, he gave them and shared them to his friends to help them remember all that those events to come, the cross would be all about. So first of all, let's pray together. We pray, we thank you Father God for the bread and for the wine, for how they speak of your love for us. We pray that as we eat and drink together, you may strengthen and encourage us as they speak of your son's body and blood, of his self-giving. May we ourselves be encouraged and fed as we eat and drink, that we may have hope and comfort, not only for today, but in the days to come. Amen. So we remind ourselves that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, having given thanks to God, it says he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples. He says, break your bread you have, and let's eat together, giving thanks that his body was given for us. So let's eat. And then it says, after supper, he took the cup, saying that this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. We drink to hear the testimony of Jesus, of his journeying, of his triumph, of his encouraging of us as we journey through these ongoing times of challenge and of difficulty. Let's drink together, giving thanks, his blood was shed for us. And let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that on the night before you died for us, you ate a meal. You gave us these symbols of bread and wine uh, to remind us of your body and of your blood that we may be encouraged and blessed in who we are. You gave us these symbols that we may feed upon them, that we may journey well for each day. We remind ourselves that we journey fitfully. We often fail and we will come to say sorry. But also in the bread and the wine, not only are we reminded that we are forgiven, but we are encouraged to persevere with Jesus because he is the one whose wrists and whose feet bear the marks of nails, who journeys with us, encouraging us and 
helping us on our daily journey. We thank you that we can feed on his promises, that we can trust in his love and in his presence to be with us through thick and thin. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Our reading is from Psalm 121 and Mike is going to read for us. Thank you, Mike. Psalm 121 from the Passion Translation God protects us. I look to the mountains and hills longing for God's help, but then I realise that our true help and protection is only from the Lord, our Creator, who made the heavens and the earth. He will guard and guide me, never letting me stumble or fall. God is my keeper. He will never forget nor ignore me. He will never slumber nor sleep. He is the guardian God for his people, Israel. Yahweh himself will watch over you. He is always at your side to shelter you safely in his presence. He is protecting you from all danger, both day and night. He will keep you from every form of evil or calamity as he continually watches over you. You will be guarded by God himself. You will be safe when you leave your home and safely you will return. He will protect you now and he'll protect you forevermore. Amen. What is the highest mountain that you have ever seen, but also the highest hill or mountain that you have ever climbed? Now, I have had the, the privilege of seeing Mount Everest in the flesh. I was in Kathmandu, met them 20 years ago, and I was able to see it from quite a long way away, but still, I'm glad I did. But I've never climbed anything as high as that. The highest thing I've climbed, actually, is Mount Tor here in Derbyshire, and that is 570 metres, or in Imperial, 1,696 feet. I've climbed that a couple of times with once Jilly and some friends. But also, the, but the hardest mountain or hill, rather, that I've climbed is a place called Wide Open Hill in the Cheviot. Now, that is 369 metres, or 1,210 feet. And the reason why that's the hardest for me is because I was carrying a full rucksack. Julie and I were out walking on one of our walking holidays and we had to climb wide open hill. It was great views, but it was a real killer. It was brutal. Now last year's text was a text that Mike read, Psalm 121, and particularly verses one and two. It says here, I lift my eyes towards the mountains where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the experience of these last 17 months, I reckon, is that we may have seen some hills ahead in our lives we've lived so far, but these ones have been probably the most challenging that we may have ever experienced. The hardest climb, the most difficult journey that we've ever made before. Psalm 121 says, I look unto the hills. It makes no statement about which one, but I want us to think about today, about one particular hill. As the hymn says, of a green hill far away, outside a city wall. The hill, of course, I'm speaking about is Golgotha or Calvary, as it is also known. My desire is that as we think about Golgotha, Calvary, that we will know it's speaking afresh into our lives, especially in the light of these last 17 months, in all the difficulties, in all the challenges that they have been to us. That, to use today's title, that the darkness of the two, that we may have felt would like, may have been a reality sometime in this month, may even now, that we may also not only know that darkness, but as the cross points us forward also to the lightness of the tomb that's empty of resurrection. But that will be part two 
in the beginning of September. So what did you write on your cross to speak about what the cross means to you? Well, I wrote, God is not apatheia. Now, apatheia is an odd word, it's an old word. It's a word that sought to honour God by saying that God is constant and reliable and unchanging. The thing is that, is that when they said this, they also therefore said that God, by the way, can't suffer or feel pain because that would suggest God changing, God doing something different, even something new. And so when they thought about the cross, they said that the human Jesus, the Jesus who was the man of flesh and blood like us, he was the one who felt the pain and the agony and the death, whereas Jesus, the Son of God, he felt none of that because God cannot die. God cannot suffer pain or suffering. And the problem of this is that when we remove God from the suffering and the pain, the cross changes meaning. And what's happened in particular is that the cross has become something to do with me and me alone. It's about my sin. It's about my need for forgiveness. It's about my being guilty, my condemnation, my being far away from God's love. Now, the cross, of course, does speak all about these things. But the point is, is that the cross does not only speak, or dare I say, merely speak about these things. This cross speaks about so much more than this. In 1973, a German theologian called Jürgen Moltmann, he wrote a book about the cross. He wrote this book in the light of 25 years of him as a German believer and theologian coming to terms with, coming to understand the evils that had been in his country during the Nazi regime. Now Moltmann, he was a German Messerschmitt pilot. He was shot down, he was a POW. And when he returned home again, it was very much his heart, his soul, his mind, what can I do to enable my country to journey through, to work through all that these evils had inflicted upon them? And after 25 years or so, he wrote a book to help him put into words this, his journey, his, his change of understanding of how this evil had been resolved. And the book has a great title to actually help us understand where and how Moltmann resolved this. Here's the book. It's called The Crucified God. There it is. It's a great, great book. I really, really liked it. The, the title wasn't his own. The title, The Crucified God, was actually a term coined by Martin Luther, the reformer. And what happened is that in this book, the whole focus is not upon me. The whole focus is upon the cross, obviously, but actually upon the cross and God. It's about God himself in his pain, in his suffering, not just in the face of evil and suffering of death in the story of Jesus. Yes, it is about that, but actually of how God himself journeys through death, through evil, through suffering, through pain, that on the cross these things are also defeated. But the defeat of them is by this God suffering them, this God enduring them, this God knowing an intensity of pain that is beyond our utmost understanding. At Golgotha, at Calvary, we rejoice in knowing peace, we know grace, we know forgiveness, we know wholeness, shalom, as Chris mentioned last week, but we know so much more. Here in The Crucified God, Mormon speaks of the God whom we discover to be a God of compassion, 
one who suffers with us. This suffering, this crucifixion is not only of one moment in time, but the suffering that God knows is a suffering he's known throughout all time and especially, not especially, but also in our time, in all that we've been through, the suffering of God has continued in these moments too. That however pained or sorrowed you've been in these last 17 months, God also understands but also experiences that pain and that suffering too. And all that you may have written about, all that you may have asked people what they've written or spoken about these 17 months, God also has entered into their own self-same suffering. And this crucified God not merely suffers, but he wants to encourage us to journey through the suffering. He wants to help us to endure this suffering. He wants us to enable to not merely look backwards, but to look forwards when suffering pain has finished. These are the depths of the cross that if we only think about me, we miss out on. Because these depths speak about the God who is with us, helping, encouraging, enabling us in all that we are in the midst of our sorrow. The psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Well, Golgotha, Calvary, is also a hill we look, lift our eyes up to. It is 731 metres, or in old money, 2,398 feet above sea level. And I've climbed it. I've climbed Golgotha. I've seen the view. But also I've discovered, as I've climbed, as I've engaged with the cross and Golgotha, something quite strange and different. Now the average height, the elevation of Jerusalem is 760 metres or 2,490 feet, which means in effect that when I climbed Golgotha, on average, I would have gone down 29 metres or 92 feet. To climb Golgotha is to go down, not to go up. It reminds us that God always comes down with us. When we enter into the valley of the shadow, God travels down with us. He journeys with us along this valley bottom where it may feel as if darkness, isolation, being alone is all that there is. But we forget the God who journeys down to the cross, down to the valley with us. And he walks with us that we may know he loves us, that we may know his blessing, that we may know his compassion, his fellow suffering. This crucified God, he walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death because he's familiar with it, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. This is not new territory. This is familiar territory God to God and he walks along with us because he promises never to leave us. He promises never to abandon us. And so Wherever you are this day, may you know his promise. May you know his presence with you to comfort, to reassure, to be this compassionate, crucified God. Let's pray together. We pray, Father God, as we've thought about the darkness of the tomb, we just recognise these last 17 months have included for all of us dark and difficult times. We remind ourselves of the numbers of cases of those who have died, 
of those who've been affected by long COVID. And it is sober and sorrowful reading of these millions of people, these 140,000 in our own country who've died. It is breathtaking. Pray still for those who grieve that they may know your comfort and your strength. We pray for those who are journeying through the long journey, the long journey of long COVID. May they know your compassion, uh, your fellow suffering with them, as they continue to seek to rebuild their lives. May you strengthen, lay your healing hand on them, we pray. We thank you, Father God, for all of the vaccination programs that have brought so much relief and comfort and strength and hope. We pray, Father God, for the campaigns throughout the world to inoculate, to vaccinate this world as quickly as possible. We pray again for a collaborative, cooperative effort by the governments of our nations to seek to spread the vaccination as wide as possible. And as we think about nations working together, we pray for the climate conference coming very soon, COP26. We remind ourselves, we've seen the videos, the pictures of forest fires, whether it's in Africa or whether it's in South America, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in California. We've seen the floods in Europe, we see and we hear about hurricanes and typhoons. We recognise that our climate is changing and we recognise our responsibility. We pray our loving God that we as nations of this world may seek to move to a more sustainable style of development. We recognise the ways in which the pollutants affect and impact this world in which we live. Help us, our God, to have the courage to learn to think differently, the model of ever growing, of ever development is unsustainable. Help us to view and to see life in different ways. We pray particularly for those nations, those third world nations who are seeking to become as industrialised, to reap the benefits that we have done. But yet at the same time, help us, we pray, to enable them to reap such benefits, but yet not in such a destructive model, a slower model for sure, a more long-term model. Help us, we pray, as nations, as governments, to dare to grasp this nettle, this challenge our God, because our loving God, we are called to look after, to care, to nurture, to pass on the world to a next generation, not to destroy it. Our God, at this moment of crisis, we pray for clarity and for courage. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. We conclude our service by singing the song Cornerstone. Let's sing, reminding ourselves, the cross, that Jesus is the cornerstone of our lives that we are to live day by day.
we draw our service to together together the joy of the creating father be your strength the love of the ascended savior sustain your spirit the power of the holy spirit uplift you may you have a great week in all that you do don't forget hold on to your cross Put it summer, put it in your fridge, just to remind us to pray for those who you talk to, to pray for them, to have, to be aware of the God, the compassionate God, who walks and shares in their suffering. Have a great week in all that you do, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Next week is Simon Russell, and he is always a star. So blessings, have a good week, and goodbye.